You may think that calculus began and ended with Newton and Leibniz. But did you know that there are nine discoveries that followed one another, without which calculus would never happen? And not only that, the formation of calculus did not finish with Newton and Leibniz. The last calculus discovery happened a century after Newton, and is a completely different calculus than the one that was first discovered. No, I did not know that. It goes way back. The first discovery, without which calculus would not be possible, took place in ancient Greece, when Archimedes tried to find the area and volume of shapes. It's called infinitesimals and the method of exhaustion. This method involved inscribing and circumscribing shapes with known areas. Essentially, if we take a circle, we would draw the polygon inside and outside of the circle. As the number of sides increased, the difference in area would become smaller and smaller. Archimedes, for example, used this method to approximate the area of a circle by inscribing and circumscribing it with polygons, thereby getting increasingly accurate approximations of pi. The method of exhaustion was effective but inefficient and did not exactly lend itself to generalization for other complex shapes. That's when we get to the second discovery that led us to calculus, the method of indivisibles. For that, we need to go all the way down to the Italian Renaissance. Bonaventura Cavalieri, an Italian mathematician, was a pivotal figure in this transition. He developed the method of indivisibles, which he described in his work, which translates to geometry, developed by a new method through the indivisibles of the continua. Cavalieri imagined a geometric figure as being composed of an infinite number of parallel, infinitely thin slices, which he called indivisibles. By calculating the sum of these slices, he could determine the area or volume of the figure. This method, though still not rigorous by modern standards, was a significant advancement because it simplified calculations and could be applied to a much wider range of shapes. Uh, the difference isn't that clear to me. We're essentially constructing the shape by approximation, are we not, in both theories? Let's take an example. Imagine you want to find the area of a circle. With the method of exhaustion, you would start by inscribing a circle and circumscribing a circle. You would increase the number of sides of the polygons to get a better approximation. For the method of indivisibles, we can even take a 3D shape. For example, to find the volume of a cylinder, one could imagine the cylinder as being composed of infinitely many circular disks, all stacked on top of each other. Each disk's volume is easy to calculate. Using the formula of the area of a circle, pi r squared, multiplied by the infinitesimally small height of each disk and the volume of the cylinder can be found by summing the volumes of all these disks. While the method of indivisibles was effective for calculating areas and volumes, it was somewhat limited by its geometric nature and the specific shapes it could easily handle. The growing complexity of problems that mathematicians wanted to solve called for a more general and flexible approach, one that could easily handle a wider range of shapes and problems. Incredible how calculus started with trying to figure out the area and volume of shapes, which is such a visual process, and yet somehow it became so algebraic as well. Right. The next discovery, without which calculus would not be possible, was made by René Descartes and Pierre de Fermat, and is called coordinate geometry. Both René Descartes and Pierre de Fermat realized that by introducing algebra into geometry, they could represent geometric figures as equations and use algebraic methods to solve geometric problems. This was a significant shift from purely geometric methods to an algebraic approach. In his work, La Géométrie, Descartes laid out the foundation for coordinate geometry, also known as analytic geometry, where points on a plane are defined by their coordinates x and y. This allowed for the algebraic representation of geometric shapes and enabled the use of algebraic equations to describe lines, circles, and curves. Independently, Pierre de Fermat developed very similar ideas, using algebraic methods to study geometric problems. As always, though, further discoveries were needed to study these curves. And therefore, the fourth discovery that led to calculus as we know it is... Tangents and optimization. Since curves could now be described by equations, their geometric properties could also be analyzed using algebraic methods, fundamentally changing how mathematicians approach the study of geometry. Pierre de Fermat devised a method to find tangents to various curves, which is akin to finding the derivative of a function at a point. A tangent to a curve at a given point 
is a straight line that just touches the curve at that point without crossing it. The key property of a tangent is that it has the same direction as the curve at the point of contact, meaning it has the same slope as the curve at that point. Imagine a circle on a piece of paper. If you were to draw a straight line that just touches the circle at a point, the point where the line and the circle meet is the point of tangency. And what about the optimization part you mentioned? Optimization refers to the process of finding the best optimal solution inside of a set or from a set of possible solutions. In mathematics, this often means finding the maximum or minimum values of a function. For example, this can involve finding the highest or lowest point on a curve. These points are where the function reaches its maximum or minimum value. The study of tangents to curves naturally leads to the concept of instantaneous rate of change, a fundamental idea in differential calculus. By considering the slope of the tangent line to a curve at a point, mathematicians could describe how a function changes at precisely that point. Incredible how we've gone through finding the area of a circle to graphs and tangents. But calculus is still way bigger than that, right? Right. This all leads to the fifth development in the evolution of calculus, the fundamental theorem of calculus. That is the famous beginning of what we now know to be calculus, discovered by Newton and Leibniz. This theorem bridges the concepts of differentiation and integration. Differentiation is the mathematical process of finding how a function changes at any given point. In practical terms, differentiation gives us the slope of the tangent line to the curve at any point, which can be used to find maximum and minimum values of functions. Integration involves adding up an infinite number of infinitesimally small quantities. Geometrically, this can be represented finding the area under a curve between two points or the volume of a solid. The concept of integration can be seen as the inverse process of differentiation. If differentiation gives the rate of change of a function, integration sums up all those tiny changes to give the total amount of change. This was something that mathematicians struggled to connect, exactly because they were inverse. The fundamental theorem of calculus was able to resolve that. However, the initial formulation of calculus by Newton and Leibniz, based on the concepts of infinitesimals and fluxions, were not rigorously grounded in a formal mathematical framework. This lack of rigor led to the sixth key development in the evolution of modern calculus, through the work on limits and continuity by Augustine Louis Cauchy and others in the 19th century. I suppose any original theory will lack some sort of proof, but what does it mean to be lacking in rigor? It means that there wasn't really a solid foundation to resolve paradoxes and ambiguities, those associated with these intuitive concepts. A limit describes the behavior of a function as its argument approaches a particular point or infinity. Limits allowed mathematicians to define derivatives and integrals without resorting to infinitesimals, thus grounding the calculus in a rigorous mathematical framework. Cauchy along with Karl Warstrass, defined continuity in terms of limits and provided clear definitions for the derivative and the integral based on these concepts. Cauchy's work laid the groundwork for the formal study of functions, sequences, and series. I see. We're getting to the end. And yet I see that there are still some differences between where we stopped now and where modern calculus is. So what's the next discovery? The seventh discovery is real analysis. Even with the foundational issues of calculus addressed, mathematicians face new challenges, such as understanding the behavior of functions with peculiar properties. For example, functions that are continuous everywhere, but differentiable nowhere. Real analysis offered a framework for addressing these challenges, refining the understanding of continuity, differentiability, and integrability. Real analysis allowed mathematicians to work with a broader range of functions and to understand their properties with greater precision. That sounds about right, but what about complex numbers? Seems like we've forgotten about them. This concept paved the way to the eighth key discovery, the extension of calculus to complex analysis. While real analysis focuses on the real numbers, mathematicians began to explore the possibilities of extending calculus to complex numbers, numbers of the form a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers, and i is the square root of minus one. This exploration led to the development of complex analysis, which deals with functions of complex variables. Augustin Louis Cauchy 
developed the theory of complex functions, introduced the concept of residues, and formulated the Cauchy Integral Theorem. Bernard Riemann further expanded the field of complex analysis by introducing the concept of Riemann surfaces as a way to study multi-valued complex functions. Riemann's ideas on the geometry of complex functions, along with his famous Riemann mapping theorem, really advanced the study of complex analysis and also its connections to other areas of mathematics. It is based on the summing of areas of rectangles under a curve and works well for functions that are continuous or have a limited number of discontinuities. Phew, almost done. <laughs> now the last one. So what was the problem that led to this discovery? The Riemann integral was the standard tool for integration until the early 20th century. However, the Riemann integral has limitations, particularly when dealing with functions that are highly irregular, functions that oscillate infinitely. Henry Lebesgue, a French mathematician, introduced Lebesgue integration in his 1901 doctoral thesis. This is the ninth discovery. Lebesgue's approach to integration was revolutionary because it offered a way to integrate a much broader class of functions than was possible with Riemann integration. Instead of partitioning the domain x-axis into intervals, as in Riemann integration, Lebesgue integration involves partitioning the range y-axis and then measuring how much of that domain corresponds to each part of the range, now known as Lebesgue measure, which is capable of handling sets with complex structures. What a crazy ride that was! Crazy to think that only Newton and Leibniz are talked about when there's such a long road. Indeed, modern calculus is impossible without the previous discoveries. They were steps towards achieving functional analysis, differential geometry, and even physical concepts like quantum mechanics. And the best thing is, it is still an evolving field. If you like this video, I'm sure you're gonna love this one. See you there.